Hello, this is Irv Shapiro with the Dr. Vax channel on a very cold spring day here in the Midwest. Today, we're going to talk about how to print with a filament that requires a higher temperature. I receive a lot of questions on my channel about how to print PETG. Now, for me, it's a bit of a mystery because I've been printing with PETG since I began 3D printing, but I started printing PETG on a Prusa i3 MK3. And the Prusa ecosystem is relatively well-tuned, which is what you get for $1,000. So I thought today I would attempt to print with PETG on a Monoprice Ultimate 2 and on an Anet ET4, a relatively low-end printer in the Anet printer and a mid-price printer in the Ultimate 2. So stay tuned and let's learn something together. Now the first question we have to answer is why would you want to use PETG instead of PLA? PLA comes in many, many different colors. This was printed in PLA. This was printed in PLA. This beautiful vase was printed in PLA. PLA is in fact quite strong. It's one of the stronger pure filaments, meaning a filament that doesn't have other things added to it. It's relatively flexible. If you print it thin, you can actually bend it. This was printed in PLA thin. So why would you want to use PETG? Well, two reasons. Its characteristics under stress are different. In many ways, it's stronger because the adhesion of layers in PETG is much stronger than PLA. Now, if you remember when we 3D print, we print a layer at a time. This way, PLA is very strong. This way, it's not so strong. PETG is much stronger this way between layers. But the more important reason is temperature. The glass transition point, the point at which the plastic becomes pliable and soft. Not that it melts, but it becomes pliable and soft. Of PLA is only 60 to 65 C. That's about 140 degrees Fahrenheit. So let's say you want to print something you're going to put into your car. You're going to use to hang something from your mirror. Put it on your dashboard. If you print it in PLA on a hot summer day under direct sun, it will begin to droop it will begin to deform because it will reach the glass transition point. The glass transition point of PETG is anywhere from 80 to 100 degrees centigrade, significantly hotter. So you wanna use PETG if you want better layer adhesion, and more importantly, if you wanna use it in a place where it needs to be able to handle more heat. So I'll give you an example. These are little sanding blocks. This one still has the brim attached. And I use them in woodworking. Now, when you're sanding something, it gets pretty hot. So in fact, if I was to make these out of PLA, they might begin to bend under heat. I use these on a wood lathe, turning very, very fast. And so that wouldn't be a good choice. PETG works extremely well. Now, a disadvantage of PETG is that because layer adhesion is very good, pulling off supports is much more difficult on PETG. If this was PLA, these supports would come right off. In this case, I'll probably use an X-Acto knife to trim the supports off of this sanding brace. So PETG has a higher glass transition point it is stronger layer adhesion. Now, if I want the ability to, to use a part in higher temperatures, why not use ABS? Well, because ABS gives off terrible, harmful fumes when you print it. So now, let's talk about safety. If you look at the slide that's on the screen right now, 3D Insider ran an article where they quoted a number of industry sources. PLA considered safe. So where does PETG fall in the range? Well, PLA is made from organic materials like maize and sugarcane. PETG is still a synthetic. 
and therefore does it give off fumes and are they a problem? In general, while PETG is considered more complex and I would always use good ventilation, and I'm not giving medical advice here, PETG is generally considered safe. Now, I did a very unscientific study of my own using a air quality meter. Now, this air quality meter looks at particulate material, meaning fine things like dust in the air. It also looks at two other types of compounds. The first is formaldehyde, which is considered unsafe, but in fact, there's formaldehyde in every home because some of the insulation in your walls, various plastic items give off formaldehyde, and TVOCs. Now, I took a look at the levels here in my basement lab before I started printing, and then while I was printing PETG, and let's look at this slide together. So you can see on this slide that I took and I put the meter literally on top of my Ultimate 2, Monoprice Ultimate 2 printer. I opened up the top cover. The Ultimate 2 is a fully enclosed printer. I wanted it to be exposed to all of the fumes. And here's what I found. In terms of TVOC levels, these are the acceptable levels. Um, and I found this on a website from TCAM. TCAM is a group that does consulting for industrial manufacturers to minimize fumes in their environment. Um, and they source their data from a variety of government sources. And what I found was that any level less than 0.3 milligrams per meter cubed is considered low. In fact, less than 0.3 is absolutely acceptable. And I was at 0.117. So 0.117 is less than half of 0.3. Uh, half of 0.3 would be 0.15. So even at the worst reading, PETG, at least the PETG that I did this test with, and that was actually Hatchbox PETG, did not give off more TVOC fumes than is considered absolutely safe. I did the same thing with particulate matter that was considered safe. And I'll link to these slides in the description below so you can see this. Uh, safe levels of particulate matter are considered 35 micrograms per meter cubed and I was at two. And then with formaldehyde, um, I was at 0 0.025 milligrams per meter cubed. And in general, anything below 0.12 was quoted in an EU study as being safe. So once again, in all three cases, PETG um, was giving off less fumes than the safety standards say is safe. Now, I generally don't want to breathe anything. I don't have to breathe. So I do use an exhaust fan anytime I print. And most of the time I'm printing with PLA, except when I need better layer adhesion and higher temperature control. Now, why do people think PETG is hard to print? And why didn't I have any issues when printing on my Prusa i3 MK3? Well, let's look at this slide together and look at the things you have to consider. The first is your bed must be completely level. Now that's generally a good idea for every printer. Um, I have printers with both auto bed leveling and manual bed leveling. Your bed must be level to print with PETG. Number two, you have to think about bed adhesion. And the way I handle bed adhesion is to use Magic Goo. Now this tube is about 18 bucks. I think that's about the right price. Um, they last me a long, long time, maybe six months or more for a tube, and I do a fair amount of printing. You apply this to your print surface. On both of the printers that I use today, I'm using glass print surfaces, but I've used it with a variety of different types of print surfaces. And I apply it about every three to four, maybe three to five prints. I find this does two things for me. Number one, it helps with the adhesion of all filaments, PETG in particular, to the print surface, but also PLA. Number two, it helps with release. 
at least on glass. If I wait till that glass completely cools and I've used this, um, whatever I've printed will pop right off. If it doesn't, I take a single edge razor blade and I just slide it under a little bit. Because it's glass, I don't have to worry about scr scratching it and it comes right off. So the bed must be level. You must be, have good print bed adhesion. Number three, you got to get the temperature right. And these are not all the same. So this is Hatchbox PLA. It recommends a temperature range of 220 to 250. This is Prusa PLA. It recommends a temperature of 250, which means that I can't print it on all my printers. I can print it on the ANET ET4, which has a top temperature of 250. This actually says 250 plus or minus 10. I can't print this on the Ultimate 2, which only goes up to 235. I could print this on my Prusa. And the very first PETG that I found really easy to print that I purchased was from Sun LU, Sun Lu, and it says it has a print temperature of 230 to 250. So every PETG is different, and you need to get the temperature right. In general, most of the PETGs, I set the temperature of the print bed to 80 C. There is one exception, and that's my Ultimate 2. My Ultimate 2 is fully enclosed. If I leave all the doors closed, it gets pretty warm in there, so I lower all the temperatures by 5 or 10 degrees C, and I determine that via experimentation. Next you are going to have to retune your retraction in order to minimize stringing. As you'll see on the various prints I printed on these two printers with PETG, there's a fair amount of stringing. Stringing is a little bit more of a problem with PETG, so you have to fine tune temperature and retraction. Now in my case, the majority of the parts that I print with PETG are things like shelf brackets or this case a sanding wedge. They are things where stringing wouldn't be obvious. They're not decorative items like this cube. For those I'm generally using PLA. But if you are printing something that has the potential for stringing, you're going to see a little more stringing of PETG. And then finally, and here's the kicker, this is the reason I think most people fail when printing with PETG. I think their G-code start code. The code you put into your slicer when you start a print is wrong. What's wrong about it? Well, very often in start code, in particular if you're using ABS, but in general if you're going to print what's called an index line or a waistline, that's a line that's printed on the side of your print bed in order to get the filament flowing, often you'll see hard-coded into the start code, something like set the extruder to 200, set the bed to 60. That works great for PLA. But guess what? That's not going to work for PETG. If they don't have that in their start code, they may actually have nothing about temperature. So what's going to happen is the slicer is going to run the start code. It's then going to get ready to print. Depending on the firmware on your printer, it's going, the slicer is going to issue a command to set the temperature, let's say to 230 degrees C. It's going to take a while for that to warm up. You're going to go and start printing. The printer's not going to be at 230 degrees C yet. It's going to print, if it prints anything at all, it's not going to stick to the print bed. So it is very, very important in the G code start code, and we're going to look at that together now, they have the right commands to wait for your printer to reach the proper temperature before it prints both the index or the weight line, the line that's used to start the flow, and as importantly or more, before you go to print your actual object. So let's look at some G-code together here on the screen. Now when you look at this G-code, you'll see two, three different sections. You'll see G-code that's in white, that's sort of generic stuff. You'll have G-code in yellow. Those are specific things I had to make sure were right to print with PETG. They were not in the G-code I've been using on these two printers. I didn't have the wait commands later on after the initial setting of the temperature. So I'd print my index line, the printer would start cooling off, I'd go to print, it wouldn't stick to the print bed. 
and then you'll see some items in red. Those are items that can cause problems and are often in a lot of G code. So let's walk through this. You'll see the first M104 command is a command that says set, put the extruder at 200 degrees, put the bed at 40, and then it's commented out in this case, but depending on whether I have an auto bed leveling system or not, do a G29, which will run the auto bed leveling system. Then if you skip over the yellow, are the commands to actually print that waistline or that index line. Well, if I don't have commands to reset the extruder and reset the bed, they're still going to be at 200 degrees Celsius and 40 degrees Celsius. PETG will not print there. The waistline will not print. And in fact, trying to force filament through my print head when it's at too low over temperature, it's just a bad idea. It can cause it to jam. You'll hear the extruder grinding. So I added these commands, the one M140 to set the bed temperature and then the M190 and to wait for it. The M104 to set the material temperature and the M109 to wait for it. I then go ahead and print my index line. And then once again, down below, I added the wait commands. I had the commands already in there to set the bed and the material temperature, but I didn't have a wait. So because I didn't have a wait, I would start printing my actual object and the temperature wasn't right. So your bed must be level. You must have good bed adhesion. You have to get the temperatures right. You're probably gonna have to fine tune retraction, but most importantly, your start G code has to be proper. Now, if you get all of those things right, what can you expect? Well, let's look at some of the things I printed. So this is the first thing I printed. This is actually a hockey puck for a game called Knock Hockey. It's a desktop hockey game. Um, I print these out of PLA, out of PETG, whatever I have in the printer. This printed beautifully. Because it was printed on glass, it's very, very smooth. I then printed this little uh, toy this is a toy that snaps together. And this is the first time I realized that getting supports out are a little bit tricky because there was actually some fill in here and I had to use an X-Acto knife to get it out. Now, this is a very interesting print. There was an electrician in my house when I was doing this print. He had shut off all the power to my house in the middle of this print. I was printing this on the ANET ET4. Power came back on. I went to the front of the printer. I said, restart. It restarted perfectly. So I know there are a lot of people have mixed opinions about the ANET ET4 because it has proprietary firmware. I've become a fan of it. Now, I don't like everything about it, uh, but it's a pretty solid printer. This printed on it. Then I printed this item on it. This is a longer print that took about four hours. Um, it printed very, very well. There's no drooping, but the only problem with this print is it's a little messy because there's a bunch of stringing. So I'll either have to drop the temperature a little bit or fine tune retraction to get the, this to print even better. Then I wanted to see how well layer adhesion would be on a long, narrow tower. So I created this tower in Tinkercad and I printed it and it printed beautifully. Next, I went to print with some Prusa, Prusa Mint PETG. All of these were printed with Hatchbox PETG. Um, and this uh, little sanding block was printed on the ANET ET4 at 230 degrees centigrade, and it printed beautifully. The only problem, once again, is getting the brim off is a little tricky, and you're gonna have to use an X-Acto knife. Then I switched over to my Ultimate 2, my mono price. I printed a pretty hard to print item, and um, I don't have the extrusion, the flow rate just right. So this, is, this little box is supposed to open and close. It doesn't. Um, overall, the print is actually quite nice. I printed another item that has close tolerances. It printed quite nice. But both of these are a little bit messy, which means that while I was able to print very successfully on the Ultimate 2, just like the stringing on the A-Net, I do have to do a bit of tuning. Now that takes us to a fundamental belief I have about 3D printing. It's as much art as it is science. 
Now, I guess if you spend three, four, five thousand, you can spend fifty thousand dollars on a 3D printer and it comes with a technician to set it up and they fine tune it for materials that they manufacture. You're in a factory, it'll probably work right every day. But if you get a printer for $200 or $300 or even five or $600, you should expect you have to do a little bit of tuning to get it right. And it will depend very much on the filament you use. Next, I wanna look at this vase. Now this vase was printed on a Prusa i3 MK3. It was printed in ColorFab XT. ColorFab XT is a PETG variant. It, it printed, I believe, at 235 degrees Celsius, and it points out a very important thing. PETG has the ability to print things that are very, very clear, or at least translucent, something that's much more difficult in other, other filaments. So in summary, if you level your bed, you get the temperature right, maybe you tune retraction a little bit, most importantly, you use a bed adhesion material so you both can stick to the bed and release from the bed because PETG does stick layer to layer very well. So some materials it won't release well unless you use something on there. You have the ability to print PETG on printers ranging from $200, $250 ANET ET4 printers, to $500 Ultimate 2, Monoprice Ultimate 2 printers, to $1,000 Prusa i3 MK3s. Folks, thanks so much for watching. If you enjoyed this, give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the channel, share this video with everyone you know, and most importantly, let's continue learning things together.